Welcome to Data BS, a show dedicated to tackling the big questions impacting the world of data and ML AI without any of the BS. My name is James Weingar. Each week I sit down with guests from across the data ecosystem to unpack how they're shaping their businesses or the businesses of others through the real world application of data engineering, ML AI, infrastructure, analytics, and more. No fluff, unfiltered, but slightly edited during move noise. This is Data BS. Let's get into it. All right, Jamil, tell me who you are, where you work, and what do you do? So I'm Jamil Bucare. I work at FireZone. I spend a lot of my time on GitHub trying to build a security product. So we're building FireZone. It helps companies secure their data and networks. What exactly is FireZone, if you had to like define it? So FireZone is a zero trust access product. It's similar to a VPN, but it's a little bit different, which we'll get into later. And and yeah, it's... it's yeah, zero trust. It's zero a zero trust network access. <laughs> right. Yeah. So zero trust access control kind of thing. It's pretty complicated as compared to like a traditional VPN. So I guess let's start off with what's a traditional VPN? Like describe that. Yeah. So what it does is it wraps your data, basically encapsulates all of your network traffic, right? Into another network. And so what that does is it allows you to essentially appear or pretend like you're within that network, right? So companies have used this for some time to, for example, if they've gotten an office or they've, if they got a branch office, right, a physical office, they've got employees there. When the company, when the employees are remote or is working from home, they'll typically VPN into that office. And what that does is it makes it appear that the employee is physically in the office. We saw like a big boost in business for VPN providers and things like that when COVID started or what was going on with that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. That was interesting. We, we all had to start working remotely pretty much right all around the world. And I think a lot of companies had a, what's known as a perimeter based access model, um, that's tied to the physical location of their office, right? So employees come to the office and they have servers, or maybe even the, the office has a static IP, for example, they've configured all of their, their cloud apps to grant access to just that IP. And so suddenly people have to work from home and they had to, they're struggling to, to, to cope with that, that change. And yeah, v, I was at Cisco at the time and I remember I was already working remotely. Cisco had a hybrid workforce or still has a hybrid workforce and I remember everyone had to start working from home. So we had to start VPNing, VPNing, is that a word? Authenticating yeah. to the VPN concentrators. And obviously we're using Cisco's gear. We're using Cisco AnyConnect. And I just remember them struggling to keep up with the demand, which is a little surprising to me. And Cisco had traditionally was a sort of perimeter based model and all the industry was. And you had to VPN into the internet to get anything done, to check your email, to use the GitHub instance and so forth. So that was a little, yeah, that was a little shocking to me that <laughs> they got it fixed after two or three days. I'm sure that there's a lot of fires that, that folks were putting out, but yeah, it was. So that was just one example of the company that I was working at Cisco, but but there's many others. So let's talk about a little bit about FireZone and like what FireZone actually is. It's like a, as like a zero trust access management tool and then how it differ is differentiated across like other VPN solutions or zero trust platforms. So we talked a little bit about VPNs and what they do, how they work, and the problem they solve in regards to physical or perimeter based security. The issue with that model is anyone in the network, right? If I'm in the office, I could just plug in a laptop uh, without, if, if there's no other further protections and I have lateral access across the whole network, right? So if I VPN into the office, I have that same access. Right, because I'm now on the network. There's been a big push towards what's known as a zero trust access model. And there's a NIST standard on this, and I'd recommend folks check that out if they're interested in reading more about it. But essentially what that does is, or the whole idea behind that is instead of getting, instead of opening sort of one tunnel into a network and having the same access as if you were on physically on the network itself, you instead have these little encrypted tunnels, whether it's TLS or WireGuard to the services and the applications directly that you want to, that, that you, you want to access. And the access control is a lot more granular. So there's no lateral movement. For example, if you have access to a web application right within the intranet and 
it doesn't necessarily imply that you can access the database <laughs> directly behind it or another web application necessarily, even if it's on the same host. So FireZone, we actually moved from, it, it was more of a VPN, I would say the, the early MVP. And we experimented with that. We, we built on that. We collected a lot of feedback. As we started building though, we realized that the industry is definitely moving in the zero trust access, right? Direction. And any large organization that's looking to adopt a remote access of strategy, they're going to be moving in that zero trust access direction as well. So yeah, we re-architected FireZone about a year ago and turned it into this, this zero trust access product. So what does that mean? What it means is FireZone is now a cloud delivered product where the control plane is running in the cloud and the data plane you host and manage yourself and you install fire our client applications onto your workforce's machines and and they get access to each individual service that that you configure for them so it's similar to a traditional vpn in that access is in in terms of how it works right like the underlying encryption and the tunnels and things like that but it's different from a vpn in that the end user is only able to access the individual applications and services that you can figure for them. One way to think about it is that's a VPN plus. So you, you, have, you take a VPN, add some role-based access control or ACLs, access control list to that VPN so that it manages different tunnels for different like end locations. So do you have a separate tunnel for each like resource that you connect to, or is it like an aggregated tunnel? And then there's some handoff there that, that manages that. So the way FireZone works, you run a gateway. It's what we call our, the other side of the VPN connection. It terminates the tunnel on the other side of the, so one side of the tunnel is the employee's laptop. The other side would be the gateway. So you take the gateway, you would deploy it on a VM. You can put it in a Docker image. Uh, you could put it in Kubernetes, just wherever you need access. There are little Linux binaries. We build them in Rust. The gateway is built in Rust and it's statically linked. So there's no dependencies and it just needs an environment variable to run. In other words, it's designed to be very portable and lightweight. You can put them anywhere, right? Uh, a common way that our customers are deploying it is into the same network. You just drop them into the same network as, as the resources that you want to protect. Now, a resource could be the network itself. It could be an IP address. It could be a web application that you define by its DNS address. And what will happen is when the end user wants, tries to access that service. So they go into their browser, they open the browser, for example, and they put in gitlab.company.com. The FireZone client will see that request and in real time, it will, it will punch a hole in the firewall. Uh, we call that NAT traversal, right? Into whatever, wherever that gateway is deployed. So you don't need to reconfigure your firewall to deploy the gateways. And it'll set up a secure tunnel to that gateway so that the employer or end user can access the resource behind it. And so that one tunnel will be used to multiplex all access to that resource and any other resources you have in that site. So what's a site? A site is just a shared connectivity context. It could be a VPC, it could be a LAN, but the idea is that all of the gateways you put into a site have access or it can talk to all of the resources in that site, right? And that's what we use to, to power our high availability features for the gateway as well. So all of the gateways in a site They'll fail over for each other. They'll load balance for each other in a round robin fashion. That's uh, yeah, a little bit more detail about how FireZone works. So we have high availability because the gateway, there's multiple gateways that you could deploy within a given network or area or site as we're calling it. And these gateways handle all the like distribution of the traffic and things like that. And you also, because you manage and deploy it, if it's on-prem, you kind of have whatever fixed resources, like we were talking about with like the Cisco situation, or if you're in a cloud environment, you can dynamically scale them up with auto-scaling groups or something, something like that in AWS or Google or Azure. So really portable to any environment, really. And then customers could manage multiple sites as well. Yeah, like a co-location or you got your own data center or you have your AWS account, et cetera. And based off of the type of employee and their roles or whatever group memberships and things like that, then it'll manage their access control across like different sets of resources. So you've been away from perimeter security and you're really securing the individual resource object 
at that point. That's right. Yeah. And so you're getting into fire zones access model, right? A little bit about how it's different. The issue, the existential issue with zero trust is by opening the door to this granular access model, it creates a combinatorial explosion and the number of rules you need to manage, right? Because now you've got this web of this employee can access this thing, but not that thing. And so I think one of our customers put it to us as a, as ACL help It's just hundreds or thousands of rules and they each kind of have different Boolean modifiers and this complex syntax. And so we knew when we were re-architecting FireZone and going for this zero into a zero trust access product, we knew that was something that was going to be really important to solve. So for us, we have a few different use cases. Our, our use cases are, we have some GPU servers that we have in a co-location. That's our like on-prem network effectively that we allow access to internal resources. And then we have, because we're services companies, we have a bunch of different customers that we need to connect to. And they don't want us connecting from one of my analysts' home computer network, right? They want us to make sure that we're we have like good security policies in place. So we have a, a, like an egress or proxy site as well, which is forcing all of our traffic to, to be encrypted and things like that over um, a NAT IP, which is in Google Cloud, which allows us to basically say, hey, we're coming from this IP address. And so we can securely access our customers' environments if they whitelist our IP. And then on our side, because the fire zone allows for two-factor authentication, or this is connected to identity provider, which we have two-factor authentication and things like that on. So we have like good security controls to ensure that if you are presenting as this IP address, then you are like as authenticated appropriately. And mm -hmm. you have role-based access control or group membership in Google Workspace to say, okay, hey, like Bob has access to connect to customer A's like environment or anybody who's connected to Snowflake has to go over this, like everything, these data warehouse systems and things like that. We force the traffic over that for everybody regardless. So you have like a pretty hierarchical structure on your side and then the structure on the customer's identity provider side as well for managing access. We have our sites as the top level, like which set of network resources am I going to deploy these high available gateways into? To, to manage access, then that network is go or that site is going to have a set of resources attached to it. And then we will have policies that manage access into individual resources. And those resources can be as wide as we want it to be able to. So like in your traditional like VPN example, it'd be like the slash slash eight or 10.0.0 zero slash eight or whatever. Hey, this is the whole network or pick your RFC 1918 addresses. And, right? and just to be clear, yeah, we try not to encourage that. Yeah, they, <laughs> right, right? Like if you're going to adopt a zero trust product, right? You, you want to be moving in the direction of more and more granular access controls, yeah. right? But that's, I can enable that. And so you could say, hey, as an example, you're in an admin group and somebody's lazy and they, they do that. Don't do that. Mm -hmm. But well, it's uh, actually really common to just to jump in here real quick. It's it's really it's a really common stepping stone. So in large organizations, they go, "Hey, we need to replace Palo Alto Global Protect." This is a common thing that we've seen. We want to just mimic exactly what we have with that with Fire Zone, and then we'll take baby steps towards yeah. Yeah. So we have, you know, you have these policies that, that you then attach to the individual resource, which could be like, Hey, you're a member of this group. And now ta -da, you have access to those resources. One thing is we're talking about is like a couple of, or the set of use cases that fire zone enables have danced around them, but let's be more prescriptive about like what use cases exist for fire zone. Yeah, sure. So we, we've already talked about the traditional VPN use case. So the way that you would set that up in FireZone is you would create what we call a CIDR resource or a CIDR resource. You give it the, the actual CIDR address that you want to manage access for, and that's basically it. Make sure you have gateways deployed in the network and, and that's it. And so that use case, from what we've seen, is most applicable to companies or and organizations that are looking for a stepping stone towards zero trust. So that's so that's the CIDR sort of resource access. Another one is what James mentioned earlier, which we see becoming more and more popular, which is this third-party app or third-party cloud app access lockdown, right? Access security. 
And it could be Snowflake, it could be HubSpot, it could be GitHub, it could be Slack, essentially any cloud app that supports IP-based whitelisting. You can use FireZone to funnel or tunnel your team's traffic through a particular site where you have maybe two or three or four or five gateways running. Egress that through a static public IP. And then from the cloud application standpoint, all of your team's traffic is coming from that single IP. So it's a way to create a static IP, mimic this. Okay, we're all in the office. The office has a static IP. We're going to a cloud service. It's a way to mimic that, but with remote employees, right? And, and I think that's, there were some high profile breaches in the lot recently. And I think those were due to misconfigured Snowflake instances, right? So even if you have your authentication locked down, so let's say you've set up SSO to Snowflake and you, and great, right? Like your workforce needs to authenticate with your SSO provider, uh, with your identity provider to get into Snowflake. What happens when that process uh, is compromised somehow or a session token gets stolen, right? So that's where fires can come in to add another layer of security with this sort of IP allow listing use case. Yeah. Security in depth, right? The onion model of security, whatever we want to call it. Yeah. <laughs> Many layers. Yes. Yeah. The more protection you have, the better it is. All right. the, was that two use cases? I would say that's two. And then you can use it for the way that the way FireZone routes traffic. Maybe we should talk about that a little bit. So there's sort of two main ways we can tell what you're trying to access. One is by IP and one is by DNS name. All right. And so this sort of solves the use cases that, or I guess implements the use cases that, that I mentioned before. And there's another one, which is, so we talked about accessing a, a network, a side of range, accessing a, a publicly hosted or a third party cloud service. And then the other one is just accessing a, a private web app or a database in your VPC or in an on-prem network. And, and if to do that, we encourage users to use the DNS based resource for that, right? So how does that work? So you give it the DNS name, you, you define a resource in FireZone and uh, it's address is the DNS name, right? Of the, of the uh, thing you're trying to access. So when a client makes a query, uh, a client, when the FireZone client on a, on an end user's device essentially makes a query for that app or service, FireZone will intercept that query and it'll generate a dummy IP right in a private range that we use and and then it'll return that to the application and, and this happens within a split second and the application will then use that ip to start trying to communicate with the with the service and at that point we set up a connection and kind of it behaves like an ip based system but the cool thing about dns resources is that it provides even more granularity because we generate this dummy ip that's not the actual ip the, what that means is the clients never actually see the real IP. So no, another layer of security, they, they, there's no way to do DNS enumeration now for your DNS resources. And also because that IP is generated on the fly, you can manage access to one service, let's say a web app, but not the other service, not another service or another web app, even if it's using the same protocol port that's running on the same IP address or same host. So. Yeah, it's a way to have even more granular control. That's my point. Like we got three use cases, like traditional VPN, basically. You can cut it up a little bit better than that, but traditional VPN idea, proxying traffic through a public IP, and then being more restrictive than we were with like our traditional VPN type of use case, right? right. So right. like actually moving towards a zero trust model, like additional security controls that are being enabled by by fire zone when you're not just cutting up by ips and things like that don't give people access to the databases except for the people who need access to the databases there's no reason for like your end users to have connected to underlying databases they only need like the web server and things like that and you don't want to publicly host this web server and just do security groups in aws or things like that because that could still theoretically exposed to the world and what happens if somebody messes up security group or things like that and it's letting fire zone say hey you don't have anything open at all to the world they have to authenticate through their identity provider okay now you can connect to these resources and they're hosted you know in our vpc or in our on-prem whatever so right. we got rid of like that 
perimeter almost it's yeah in, in a sense yeah we're taking the perimeter we're moving it as close as we can to the actual thing we want to protect and that, that means that there's a lot more of them and so they're essentially your resources are just invisible to the users that don't have access to them they physically the packets will not flow through there's no chance right keep your firewall ports closed end of story so this is a this is a technique you could say called micro segmentation segmenting the network up into smaller and smaller pieces. And it's one way to do zero trust access. All right. Yeah. So, so Jamil, we hinted around like security of databases and things like that and Snowflake instance. And how do we like secure access to our data? So this is a data podcast. We got to bring it back into that instead of just the network. Like how does FireZone help us or, or zero trust network access to tooling help us protect our data assets. What is the fundamental idea that it's like helping solve for us? Yeah. So, you know, as applications, so back in the old days, right? All the core applications and services that a company needed, but they typically run on prem, right? Your email that'd be on prem, et cetera. And obviously things are moving to the cloud. So how do you manage access? So the way that everyone's already implemented and, and using today is SSO, right? So you've got, you've got SSO set up to that application or service and only the users who have access can, can reach it. As I touched on before, what if that is not set up properly or you session token kind of gets leaked and uh, now you got an issue. And so this is a flaw, not a flaw, but this is a downside that you wouldn't have if that application was running on prem. It's not just open for the, so it's not just open for the public and the whole world to access and hammer. What you can do if that application supports IP allow listing, uh, which many and more and more are, is to configure your traffic in some way to, to egress through a static IP or multiple IPs and uh, in order to reach that application. So I believe that would have prevented the, the recent snowflake based breaches, I believe, and why are more companies doing that and, and using that? I think it's due, to, it's due to complexity. The product that you're using to manage access or secure access is too complicated then, or it impacts business too much or creates too much inconvenience, right? If you're stopping business or preventing people from doing their work, then nine times out of 10, it ends up just getting turned off or holes get punched through. Oh, I'll just open this or I'll disable this rule just for an hour or two so I can access it from my personal laptop or something like that. And, or from my hotspot, my Wi-Fi is not working, whatever it is. And, and then you forget to enable it. And, and yeah, so you're back to where you started. Yeah, right? I think Snowflake's actually a really good example here because Snowflake has protections that you could use for basically all the stuff you talked about. For example, like you can disable a rule for an hour and then it'll automatically turn itself back on instead of, but what's the likely going to happen? So somebody who's doing that type of change, they're probably going to go into the, to the network access list and then just yeah. remove the rule from there and be like, oh yeah, I'll add it back later or add their hotspot IP, which hotspot IP is going to change all, all the time. Yeah. 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 Return the IP, and then some other person at Starbucks next to you is gonna get that IP, and yeah. it's it's not it's dynamically allocated to whoever. I was thinking more from a product complexity standpoint, going back to ACL Health. So, looking at a set of ACLs for a Cisco ASA firewall, how can you quickly determine if someone has access to the company GitLab instance? No, you can't audit that or evaluate that. Cause it's it, cause easily. everything's like in the same construct and then there's like hierarchy to the rules and things like that. And so what's the security model has evolved, but it's based off a different security model that was, it was designed for, which is perimeter security. <laughs> and it's these giant text files that get pushed down to the devices and, and who knows how they're managed, if it's even in version control. So um, one would hope that they're pushing it with Ansible or something like that yeah. and they have it in Git, but you know, like we, we both know it's, better. So, you know, one of the reasons why we asked you to be on Jamil is because like security products as part of protecting data is I think a, a big part of the discussion is about be around anything involving data, right? If you, if you don't have secure access to data, if your data is exposed to the world, like your risk of being in the news, or your cybersecurity insurance, or your GDPR compliance, or your CCPA compliance, or your PCI compliance, or all these other you know, things where really the crux of it all is protect the data. 
for the most mm-hmm. part. And then protecting the network is an aspect of protecting the data. From that viewpoint, let's talk about FireZone as a business. Your YC backed. It's been around for how many years? Where are you planning to go? So, uh, so uh, I think we did mention. You asked about the first commit. So building into 2021, we had an early, what I call the MVP, got accepted into YC 2021, started in the winter 22 batch. So a little over a couple of years ago now and, and added on to that MVP, probably a little too long after that, but paused on that and started building our zero trust product, what we're calling FireZone 1.0, our paid product, commercial product. In April of last year, we went GA, released 1.0 in April of this year and and it's just been growing ever since. So we had a long wait list. We were taking a sort of customers and beta testing with them for a few months. And then we opened, when we opened it, FireZone up to the general public, we had a long wait list, I think, of people wanting to try it and use it. And and so we had a little, some scale to, to, to or some load to, to scale up to meet, some demand to scale up to meet. And, but things have been pretty much smooth sailing since then. And there's a term, since you mentioned data and compliance, there's a term we used to use when I was working at Cisco that the security doesn't sell. It's not, that's true, uh, but compliance sells. And so compliance requires security. And, and so I think that's still true today. I do think security is a byproduct or it's a, as an, as a requirement is only going to grow and grow. Right. So we're not moving into a world where there's fewer compliance requirements. We're moving into a world where there's more and more complicated ones and probably more standardization, but we're moving into a world where it's going to become more important to, to require certain compliance requirements of your vendors and employees and what, and whatnot. So yeah, FireZone is very much building in that space. And, and so it's a product that we are definitely gearing for businesses and organizations to use more and more. And I think right now we're targeted for, I think our average customer size is probably in the hundreds, right? So you could say SMBs and we're a small team, but we're, we are a startup, right? So I'm not going to pretend like we're this, this big years, uh, decade old company, but we're growing into larger and lar- larger organizations sort of month by month. And the way we're doing that is like more product maturity, operational maturity, more product features and and scaling up from there so what are some of those features that you recently worked on yeah so two kind of notable ones one is the rest api so we put that together and we have an open api spec for it so you can download the spec you can generate even clients in ruby python javascript to interact with the FireZone api and so that's all about automation right so if you're a large organization you're probably going to have uh, a lot more resources and policies and gateways than a smaller company. And so you're going to need ways to automate, maybe version control your configuration, automate setting that up in FireZone. And then, so another one is, the other one is what we call the internet resource. And this is full route tunneling. So before this, FireZone was strictly split route. So it would only route the traffic that you've defined resources for from the client to those resources and all other traffic, like for, for that employee, let's say checking their personal email or going to google.com to search something, right. We just go directly out to the internet, not protected by fire zone. And that works great for the majority of the time. And it is usually what you want because you don't want all of your workforce's data going through your gateway, running an AWS. And now you have a two terabyte AWS bill that you got to pay. But in some cases, maybe you have a gateway that's running in a cheaper network <laughs> to operate and you want to ensure that certain employees or you want to provide the opportunity for certain employees to be able to protect that first top, right? So let's say they're in a public cafe, why it's not encrypted, and you want to make sure that all of the data leaving there or all of the communication leaving that laptop is, is at least encrypted with WireGuard. You can turn on what we call the internet resource or enable the internet resource for that employee and all of their traffic, their network traffic will go to the gateway that you've did for the site you've designated and egress out from there. So what's next for FireZone? What are you thinking about from a business viewpoint? Or is your ideal customer kind of still this smaller business or is it more mid-market, like thousand employee type? Like where do you see FireZone playing? I think very quickly we are moving into that mid-market size. We're targeting 
the goal is for a cybersecurity product to move into enterprise as quickly as possible. It, it's a space where these aren't new problems, right? We're solving them in s somewhat new ways. There's other competing products out there. So there's competition. And so when you put all of those together and then you add the sort of sprinkle the cybersecurity require enterprise security requirement over all of that, it creates a very high bar, right? So it's not the type of company that I think, and I'm, I've come to learn this and understand this much more clearly now after starting FireZone, but it's not the type of company where you just raise a little bit of money, you put out some crappy, some really bare bones product that just solves the problem and then it's off to the raises. It's something you're just, you've got to get, you've, you've got to have a great product. It's got to be very secure. And so that just makes it a little bit, creates a challenge, right? And, and it's been a fun one to try to solve. Uh, but yeah, we look to be growing. We want to grow up into the thousand, two thousand, three thousand company range over the next few months and, and then scale it further from there. All right. Awesome. So where can people learn more about Jamil and FireZone? You can find FireZone at our website. We're at firezone.dev, D-E-V. And uh, you can also find us on GitHub. We're at github.com slash FireZone is our main product repo. And we welcome anyone to go and explore the code, open issues there if you'd like to see features or, you have, or if you have a bug to report. And then you can find me personally on LinkedIn, just my first and last name. And I do read every DM. Uh, I don't always get around to responding to them. So apologies if I'm not super responsive. All right, awesome. Thanks for Alrighty. joining us, Jamil. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's fun. That's it for this episode of Data BS. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure you subscribe wherever you listen to your podcast and not miss the next one. This episode was sponsored by Cordine, a data consultancy that helps organizations unlock the power of their data. If you have a data challenge, we can help. Visit cordine.com, C-O-R-D-Y-N.com to learn more. See you next time.